Our speaker today is Captain Patrick O'Gara, who is a captain from Salvation Army, the Adult Rehabilitation Corps, located on Cambridge Street. Captain was born in Philadelphia and has been associated with the Salvation Army since 1998, first as a beneficiary, truck driver, shelter manager and director, community liaison, assistant corps officer, administrator, pastor, and, the, and with his wife, Oksana, the administrators for the Adult Rehabilitation Corps. In September of 2000, Captain O'Gara entered the officer's training school, and in 2002, he was ordained a minister in the Salvation Army. He and his wife, Oksana, are the pair of administrators, and they came to us by means of Providence, then Fitchburg, Albany, before they came to Worcester. Captain and his wife, Oksana, comes from Moldova, and their three children live in Holden. And he's here today to tell us about the Adult Rehabilitation Corps, because it's perhaps one of the least known agencies and what they do in the community. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you today Captain Patrick O'Gara. Well, I appreciate you uh, inviting me to speak today. I need to tell you, it's been a long time since anybody invited me anywhere, including my wife. Um, so, uh, so I can stay on track for those who are on the advisory board at the core on Main Street, you know that I can get a little long-winded, and so I'm going to stick to my notes with the history part. I'll give you a little blurb on the ARC, and then I'll open it up to questions. As Bob mentioned, the ARC, in particular of the Salvation Army, is probably one of the best-kept secrets. So let me get into a little history in case you're not familiar with the Salvation Army. William Booth, our founder, uh, he embarked on his ministerial career back in 1852, and he uh, pretty much focused on the lost souls of England. He walked the streets preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to the poor, the homeless, the hungry, the destitute. Now, William Booth was a little bit different. He abandoned the traditional concept of being behind a pulpit in the church, and he went out into the street taking the message to the people. And this uh, led to a bit of a problem with the church that he was involved with at that time and uh, their traditional preferred methods of doing things. And so as a result, he withdrew from them and he hit the streets conducting evangelistic meetings. Uh, him and his wife and then eventually the family became involved with all that. Now in 1865, William Booth was invited to hold a series of an evangelistic meetings on the east end of London. He set up a tent in a Quaker graveyard and held services there, and it was an instant success. Um, they were actually live souls who actually came to know the Lord in that place. And so he became renowned as an evangelistic preacher, and he attracted many followers who were dedicated to fight for the souls of the men and women. Now, most of these men and women that came were uh, at least the last and the lost thieves, prostitutes, gamblers, drunkards. And they were many of the first converts of the Salvation Army. And so uh, to many of the congregation, these kind of people were not the traditional people that they wanted in their church. And so William Booth found an abandoned warehouse and determined that he would open up his own church in that abandoned warehouse because these people, as we all do, needed to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and embrace it. So they didn't accept Booth's way of doing things, and he uh, went this way about it. And uh, 
so he continually preached out in the streets and then we'd bring people back to this this abandoned warehouse. Now in 1867, a booth only had 10 full-time workers for him, but by the year 1874, that number had grown to 1,000 volunteers and 42 evangelists, all serving under the umbrella of what was then called the Christian Mission. Booth assumed the title of General Superintendent, but all his followers just called him General. Uh, Salvation Army being a quasi-military setup there. And so they were known as the Hallelujah Army back in those days, and the converts continued to grow and spread throughout the east end of London into the neighboring areas. Booth was reading a, a printed article that was made about this group of people. And uh, in this printed article, he noticed a statement that just said, the Christian mission is a volunteer army. Well, his son Bramwell got a little up in arms about that, and he said, listen, I'm nobody's volunteer. I do this willingly. And so William Booth crossed out that statement there, and he penned in the Salvation Army. And that's how the Salvation Army was birthed. So from that point on, there was converts becoming uh, soldiers of Christ, and we, they were known as Salvationists, as we're still known today. We are a part of the Universal Catholic Church, not Catholic in the way that you would think. And so Booth then launched an all-out offensive to win the world for God. And he's expanded all over. I think we're currently in 142 countries uh, to date. Now, the interesting part about this is in spite of all the obstacles that they faced, I mean, literally, they got into physical battles with gangs who did not want to hear what they had to say or oppose their, uh, what they were presenting. And in spite of the violence and persecution, uh, there were more than 250,000 people who came to become part of the Salvation Army between 1881 and 1885. Now, in the interim of that, and this is where I come in, the Adult Rehabilitation Center ministry began in 19, I mean, 1881. And it happened when William Booth was coming from one side of London and coming back to the east side, and he was coming underneath of a bridge, and he noticed that there was a bunch of homeless men, women, and children, mostly alcoholics and drug addicts, who were living underneath the bridge there. And it, it visibly upset him. And when he came home, he asked his son Bram, he said, do you know about this? And he said, yeah, I'm aware. He said, well, do something about it. And it was from there that the ARC was birthed. It started out, you know, simply by opening up some homeless shelters to handle those situations for those people. And it's evolved since then. The initiative quickly spread uh, throughout England there. And initially how they did it was they recycled goods to generate their revenue. Cardboard, wood, so on and so forth. Um, that evolved so quickly that it spread over to the United States where we have a mantra that says reclaiming goods and re recycling goods and reclaiming lives through Jesus Christ. And this is involved into the entity that the Adult Rehabilitation Center is today. The Salvation Army has been providing assistance to people from a variety of social and spiritual afflictions throughout its 119 adult rehabilitation centers across the United States. We receive no governmental funding. I need to repeat that. The Adult Rehabilitation Center does not receive governmental funding, lest they take away our ability to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to meet human needs in his name without discrimination. The program is predominantly free of all, for all, regardless of race, creed, religion, or lack of religion. All of our revenue is generated out of our family stores and it is supplied by donations from the generosity of the communities that we serve and service which you would be a part of that and we thank you for that now the location at 72 cambridge street in worcester houses 115 men and women they are provided clothing housing meals work therapy counseling spiritual guidance and educational information to combat their issues it is a six and a half month to one year tough love phase program 
or they're in challenge to embrace the tools needed to become positive and productive members of society. Now, thank you, I can do my thing. I need to, as Bob has desired for me to do, I need to make you aware of the difference between Main Street and Cambridge Street. Main Street is the Salvation Army. We're all under one umbrella, but that's a social service entity. What they do is your energy assistance. They'll do some feeding programs. They're more the social service agency. When you ring the bell for them, and we thank you for that, trust me, that generates, I would say, roughly two-thirds, maybe even more than that, of their budget money for the year. Okay, that's where most of it comes from. Now, they, they do solicit government money. They do solicit grants and all that stuff. Uh, so that's what they do. But what we do, what they would call the dark side, I'm from the dark side, is we handle the in-house residential drug and alcohol treatment of the people in this, this community and the surrounding communities. Okay, that's what we do. We don't receive government money. You donate clothes, you donate furniture, that goes into the store, it generates the revenue to go into the program. The program, um, as you can imagine, can be very taxing and trying because some people want to get help, most people don't. They just want a break. All right. So we've got quite a challenge there. Um, I ch I, I'd invite any of you over at any given time to come and take a tour of our facility to see what's really going on there. It's, it's quite an interesting operation. Um, our budget is roughly 500000 to $600,000 a month. Okay? We have to generate that out of the stores or the warehouse. We recycle goods. We reclaim lives. Um, so when you donate your clothing, your furniture, your household goods, that's what it's going for. All that money. I can account for it all. Okay? And I need to make you aware that when you're donating, be mindful of who you're donating to. Because not all those entities out there, not all that money is going to where they say it's going. And I'm not opposed to people making money. Don't get me wrong. Okay? I think everybody should have the opportunity to do that. But if you want to know where your donation is going to, check it out. We can account. I would say that only 15% of our revenue generated is going to administrative costs. The rest is going back into the ministry. So, any questions? All right. Let me go back. Let me start in the back first. I'll make my way around. To finish up, you were saying something about the Catholic, the relationship with the Catholic? Not, not the, what you would call the traditional Catholic Church, universal church. In other words, we're, we are a church. We are a church. Okay? Most people don't know that. They just think we're a a charitable organization, and we are. But first and foremost, we are a church because our primary purpose is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to meet human needs in his name without discrimination. Then we do all the charity work in his name. Yes? Do I hear you say you correctly that you're operating a $6 million budget for your Cambridge Street program a year? Pretty much so. No? Yes. All right. So, uh, I guess I should have known this, but where does one take their donations? To Cambridge Street? You can. Uh, there's a variety of ways you can go about that. Me personally, I would say call our truck pickup service. We'll come right to your door and get it. Um, we're working on trying to tweak those things, but that's a possibility. You can go to any of the white donation boxes that would say the Salvation Army on it. Um, you can drop it off at Cambridge Street. Yes? How do you measure the effectiveness of what your program does for the people that have to pass through it? Great question. Um, if you're familiar with the recovery community, you know that the statistics are staggeringly low on success rates. They say that uh, one out of 100 people walking into the rooms of AA or NA will get and maintain two years of continuous sobriety. For those who come through faith-based programs, that increases slightly. So uh, you have to measure successes in, in a lot of different ways. I mean, it's, it's real simple to say, well, somebody just did 
finish this program and they've got their little certificate that says, hey, you completed, that could be one form. I don't, measure, I don't particularly measure it that way. It's, it's a part of it. I, I want to see a continuum of care. Um, that's how I measure by people who are coming back. Uh, you also measure by, even though people don't complete something, if they've continued in their process and they've gained some tools and they're continuing in their sobriety, becoming productive as detracting members of society, that's also a success rate. So there's a variety of, of formulas with that. Yes? So my question, when we go out there and ring the bell and people put in their dollars in the red buckets, um, can they say, oh, where does this go? So what's the simple answer? The simple answer is that would go to the social service entity of the Salvation Army on Main Street. Okay. And they would help with energy assistance, food, you know, variety of things, clothing. All right, now we're jumping. <laughs> you had mentioned that the uh, Salvation Army is part of, I think you said it's the Universal Catholic Church. Right. Is that is the same or is it different from the Roman Catholic Church? Very different. It's different. When I say, when I say Catholic, it, it's Catholic being universal. universal. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah, so it, 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 the definition is the Universal Christian Church. Catholic, Catholic, Catholic means all. Catholic. Catholic. Okay. Catholic Thanks. All. Helpful. Right. Right. So right. And it's separated from Roman. Yes. Right. right. William Booth uh, was a member of the Methodist Church. Actually, the Methodist New Connection back at that time was, was a break off of the Methodist Church, and then he broke off of that. So, Protestant, is, if we want to keep it simple. Let me go here and then here. How, how many people are you all serving a year in your facility? Ooh, I wish I had those statistics on me. Uh, there's a lot of people who come through. Because, well, there's a hundred, well 100, we have a 115 bed facility. Uh, 95 for men, 20 for women. The reality is, though, people come and go. It's very transient. There's, there's very few people. Basically, we, we look at a, it's a pyramid. You have a base of people who come in, and by the time they get closer to the completion of the program, it's tapered off tremendously. So once again, it's, uh, the success rate for people in recovery is very, very small. Um, we actually have a better percentage rate than most programs. I have backed up to a loading dock down in Cambridge Street and unloaded my vehicle at the loading dock. And, uh, the, the men who were there were very helpful in thanking me for bringing everything down there. And, um, my question to you is, once, once they get to the loading dock, do, do the uh, employees shake out the goods and do they display them inside? Are the goods given away, or are they sold at a nominal cost? Okay. Um, there's a, pro there's a they, we call it production process that takes place, and that's a great question, and uh, I'd love you to come down and look at the whole operation to see how it works. The people predominantly meeting you at the dock are probably not employees, but participants of the program. Now, we do have employees overseeing them. Uh, so when you, your donation's received in, it then goes to a couple different areas to be processed through to determine what is uh, able to go into a store and what is maybe going uh, to another recycling stream. Um, we try to keep waste down to a very minimal. And so uh, there's processes where it's all processed out, determined to be of a certain value. It would go into the family stores, priced, and then sold that way. And all that revenue then comes back into to support the ministry, that $6 million mirror your ministry. It might be a little bit less than $6 million now. Yes? What about uh, your relationship with the armed services, both during the war and peacetime? Um, I'm actually the guy who probably gets the after the fact, uh, people who really are suffering from the effects of that. The social service entity, which would be the core, and then the national branch of all that, uh, they're still very involved in uh, being involved in wartime efforts. I think the one that's pretty much most familiar to most, which for some reason uh, we don't get as much, we're horrible at public relations, to be honest with you. Um, most people would know that the hallelujah lassies of World War II handing out donuts and giving out stamps and all that kind of stuff to the service members. We still do those kind of things. We're just not, uh, we're not really good about promoting ourselves. I go back there first. Um, my observation over the years of the work in Salvation Army has been that it's 
dependent a great deal on volunteer help. And I'm just wondering, uh, just your, your view, uh, is volunteerism dropping off? Are you having more and more difficulty getting people to volunteer for the work? Um, from my perspective, I, and I think it, it correlates to the core perspective also, uh, I see that. I, I see more what I'm experiencing as a lack of people who, who want to freely give of themselves with pure motive, you know, to help out. Uh, mostly what I'm seeing is more people who are coming in because they have community service they must fulfill. Uh, some of that, you know, for their, their schools and churches and those are noble things, mostly uh, for the judicial system. Um, but I, I would say yes. The, I, I would think the answer to that is absolutely yes. And that's why when I still see groups such as this, it kind of warms me up a little bit because I, I think it is a dying, a dying thing. <laughs> Yes. You talked about the lack of uh, success of people who have substance abuse. How do you monitor the people in your program for compliance? Um, they're required to take compliance testing on a random basis. Through, through the Salvation Army or yes. through an outside agency? Yes. Now, if they're uh, parole or probation stipulated, and part of their stipulation is that they go to that outside entity, those departments, um, then they would also do that. But we have our own in-house stuff. And then if anything becomes of question, we send it out to a lab um, for confirmation. So it's actually pretty frequent. And there's quite a cost to that, to be honest with you. Captain, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. You take a good photo. Oh, really? I got a face for radio. <laughs> Thanks again. Uh, little gift from the club. We appreciate you. Thank you.